I wrote this paper, it's called Poetry, Place and Me, Finding Identity Through Poetry. There was a time when, on official forms, I would just describe myself as a housewife. I could see those words now emblazoned on my passport. Those words which would define me for several years, until the day came when I wrote, Writer. As a child in Guyana, I wrote what millions of us write in our school books, our full names, addresses, followed by the world or earth, the universe, the galaxy, <laughs> the night dimension, dependent on how much science you knew. It was a way of defining yourself, of centering yourself in the chaos of growing up and what we were learning about the world. Migrants are faced with having others define them time and time again. For children who move home, it's always an upsetting situation. Whether they're reasonably happy or horrors are infiltrating their lives, you knew where you were, who your friends were, and more or less where you were going in life. My first shock as a teenager to this comfortable view of the world was being called names for two reasons. For being skinny and for having white jeans. That's DNA, not denim. <laughs> this skinny calling went on for a while, but the whitey shitey barbs, thankfully, for a relatively short period, but they were the ones that stung more deeply. This is because, growing up in a mixed race household, in a country where there was such diversity, I really didn't understand why a small group of girls would wait for me on the street corner daily, call me names, and threaten to beat me up because apparently I thought I was white which kind of clashes with being accused of being white at the same time. It would take me years to truly understand the historical reasons for this outburst of racial hatred, something that didn't happen until I was uh, in my early 40s and a mature student at university. By that time, I'd become to define myself in another way, through poetry. The child who situated herself in a galaxy became a young woman who, on migration to this country, had to define herself by her place of birth and also by race. Everywhere I went I was questioned on my origins and this always became a history lesson. Not many people I came into contact with, apart from the odd merchant seaman, not that I came across many, <laughs> knew where Guyana was. Oh, you'd find them in a pub. Yeah, I've been to Guyana. <laughs> On countless occasions, I would be mistaken for being Ghanaian. My accent might not have helped, but I was quite confused as so many people knew where Ghana was and not Guyana. In due course, and because I was studying African literature, I was intrigued enough by my almost country that I sought Ghana out through its culture and went along to many a Ghanaian drumming and dancing workshop. Poetry entered my life as it does most of us at school. And I couldn't tell you what the attraction was apart from the fact I loved language and was one of those kids who was good at English. Perhaps the reason is universal and one for the scientists, the part that art plays in our development as human beings to sharpen our awareness of ourselves and our surroundings by responding emotionally to stimuli. All of us who are writers here will have experiences as to how and why they felt they wanted to write. I recently visited the Lascaux Caves in France, one of the sites of the earliest known cave paintings, and the paintings are, astound are as astounding as the narrative behind them. Have any of you been there? Yeah. It's actually a pretend one because the real one they had to shut because the human breath was affecting the paintings. Yeah. So it's actually a fake one, but it's, it's so realistic. Um, yes, those early people who were seeking to represent what they saw, a development in itself in separating the I from the other. There are paintings that illustrate the concept of perspective also, taking into consideration the curved ceilings and walls of the caves, conveying an understanding of perspective and important, importantly illuminating an understanding of how things look from someone else's viewpoint. This early understanding of empathy, I feel, is very important, proving that we do not create art in isolation, but in connection with others slash the external world. What were they, their reasons for painting? We can't dismiss the idea of a spiritual connection between our emotions and the external world, our instincts, our perceptions. Is art just to help us make sense of the world or help us to live in it? And how imperative is it to learn from others? 
If we become teachers, how critical do we need to be of others? Are we on individual journeys or a collective one? Is it simply in the Jungian sense to tell ourselves we exist? I had an idea of myself as a visual artist before I considered myself a writer. My school friends would vouch for that I was always drawing. I never for one moment thought I'd become a writer. Although, with reference to the cave paintings, painting is an early form of inscription. My writing began at about 10 years old through writing a diary. Attempting to articulate my emotions, banal as they were at the time. And as I got older and began to study English literature, began to enjoy it for its own sake. Its complexity of language, its emotional impact, its power, fact mixed with fiction, stories that told me about the ways and lives of others and other places. Embedded in this learning was a colonial education that didn't pay much mind to local writing, not until the 50s was Caribbean writing taken seriously when the BBC began a radio show in London called Caribbean Voices, which ran between 1943 and 1958, which would host poets such as Derek Walcott and Kamal Brathwaite. For anybody interested in early Guyanese writing, you could seek out the Guyanese writer Edgar Mittelhauser for his storytelling and view of the world at that time, and Martin Carter considered Guyana's best poet. Apart from Anansi stories and a few poems by Guyanese poets, most of our introduction to English literature was through Shakespeare, Byron, Burns, Tennyson, Wordsworth. It would be much later at Kent University in the 90s, when I was in my early 40s, that I would be reading poems by Martin Carter and novels by Wilson Harris. The otherness of the language of the poetry we studied, we studied which included quite a few Scottish dialect poems, and the places it mentioned, cemented a colonial view of the world and the priority of English as a privileged subject. It's quite odd for writers to write of a landscape in an alien tongue, yet that is what our early writers did, speak of the Guyanese landscape through an inherited English poetic language. It would take time for oral poetry to be respected and to address our landscape in the speaking voice of Guyana. Before I go on to speak about how an empirical view of the world changed for me, I must include other inspirations which led to me becoming a writer, music being the leader. Music has always been a motivating force in my life and all my early poems were attempting to be song lyrics. My father was a guitarist and listening to him play was one of the earliest pleasures I can recall. Like many of us, pop music, music and, and movies and drama underpinned my entire life as a developing young woman. Adolescent love, physical awareness, dance, the freedom to party and lime, all I add being held back by our strict Catholic and very West Indian upbringing, was a kaleidoscopic, trippy experience, indulged by angst and the deepest sorrow at simply being. The richness of living in Guyana at that time was also further enriched by the wealth of Hindu and Muslim festivals, African folk tales, churches, and the presence of so many other cultures around us. That the world at that time was shaped by the threat of nuclear annihilation was just an added extra. We may not have had TV, but we had radio, we had preachers, we had corporal punishment, we had aspiration, we had independence looming, and with it a questioning of our Guyanese identity. I left Guyana at a very important time. A migration brought about by the sudden death of my father when I was only 15, and racial intolerance towards certain inhabitants of the country. I would miss the struggle for identity, political idealism, and several bleak and punishing years of Guyana's new self-government. I also need to add that had I stayed, my life there would have been very difficult as racial tension was a large factor during the 70s and 80s and thousands of people left the country. The country I left therefore would always exist in my mind pre-1971 so that years later when the question where do you come from was still light conversation, I found myself almost creating a mythologised view of my country, even hesitating on the my. I wrestled early years as mother and artist, taking part in local exhibitions and immersing myself in adult education, 
I found life in the early years to be at turns both exciting and alienating. Becoming a, mo a mother and living in an area where New Caribbean people were was quite difficult. But there are also a great many positives, not least by the educational op opportunities I've been granted and also a lack of animosity towards me. I can honestly say I can count on one hand any racist slurs, although that was mostly because I did look white. Two of my sisters were not so lucky and experienced very difficult times at the then Holy Cross School. My early writing was a mix of long-winded elegies, romantic fiction and slow realisations of the juxtapositions of a domestic life. When speaking of spaces in poetry, I cannot for one moment neglect the domestic space, which is the reality of many women. Whilst this paper is not wholly concerned with that, it's important to realise that many women do not have the freedom to explore being a creative person outside the home. There are battles to be fought all along the way, whether it be restrictive relationships, lack of childcare or lack of money. I myself had many battles to fight and in some ways still do. I do count myself extremely lucky to have encountered teachers and opportunities for me to go forward in life. Those who realise that the domestic space does not mean you haven't achieved anything and thereby counting and recognising skills as carer, negotiator, time manager and being a responsible adult are every bit as important as having a degree. I, I realised that writing would be the way forward when two particular exercises in a creative writing class threw up poems about the past, a conch shell and an imaginary attic. The conch shell came from a real moment following my father's death, and the imaginary attic summoned up the presence of Guyana's indigenous peoples. I may have left Guyana, but Guyana had not left me. I knew then I had to take another journey, and that was to university. As I had no A-levels, I had to go through an access course, which I did at Thanet College, and that year was vitally important, for not only did we have remarkable tutors and fellow students, but it was a fortunate time to re-enter education. Grants were still available for students then. Tutors were not as bogged down with the changes to education and founding that funding that would come. Our English tutor cared passionately about us and started up a lunchtime poetry club. That was the start of my poetry career. Lunchtime sessions where we wrote poems, shared our work and eventually read our poems to other students and teachers in the drama department. This was the beginning for me, and from that beginning, I and a small group of poets would start to put on poetry readings in places like Bullstone's Library. My English tutor was pivotal in my life. She introduced us to the work of Lyndon Quasi Johnson, Abdul Malik, Michael Smith, and I was astounded by the work of these poets and their delivery. Here was music and poetry fusion. I was amazed to learn of the existence of these wonderful poets who were echoing what I felt in my heart. She also did a very special thing for me. She wrote to the then Kent Arts officer, John Rice, about my poetry, and he invited me to read at Cranbrook Library with John Agard, a fellow Guyanese poet who even back then had achieved a successful career. Talk about starting at the top. Even though I had no idea who he was at the time, watching him perform was an eye-opener and it dawned on me this was something I'd like to do more of. At university, all my interests were beginning to come together, reading poetry with others, going to performances, studying literature and hearing more about our history, as well as being asked to run school workshops and slowly gaining publication. I remember traveling to the Hastings Literature Festival, my first taste of the poetry world, that so many of us regularly do now, travelling miles and miles for no fee to read for six minutes. <laughs> Going to university was a defining time of my life as something shifted in the way I saw myself and the way that others saw me. I was being defi defined as Caribbean and as black, whereas we thought ourselves as being Guyanese, me and my family, and coming from South America. The terminology of the time defined all writers of colour as black. I had no issue with that. I was proud to be seen as representative of the diaspora, although there were many issues around the designation. I thought of my father and his untold story, following in the wake of poet Grace Nichols' collection, I is a long memory woman. I began to think about the stories I'd not been told, 
and the lack of any positive appreciation of our African links. In my academic life, I've seen the change in terminology disregard the use of the word coloured and mixed race be employed. I would see Guyana be included in the Caribbean, although geographically in South America. I would see references to oral language move from patois to creole to nation language. Writing essays were fraught with using the right terminology. The positive side of being labelled as being from another culture was to provide a platform for my work. There, at that time, was a lot of interest in Caribbean writing. I remember being offered readings with Jackie Kay and James Berry in Canterbury because then Kent had an arts officer and there was funding to put on events and the arts were really flourishing during the 90s. Over the years, events would be run all over Thanet, walks and talks and projects, local businesses, poetry competitions, events for the community, and in 2002, this would lead to us organising Thanet's first live literature festival inscribing the island, brought about by Thanet's first arts officer, Christina McQuaid. It was quite nice to think that we had an arts officer at one time. <laughs> Some of the awards I've got um, include fellowships to go to the Caribbean, um, working at, uh, uh, I had a fellowship at Southampton University to teach international um, literature to trainee teachers, um, the Commonwealth Prize, and also being invited by the BBC to write a poem for Thanet, for Kent, and I wrote a poem inspired by the North Foreland Lighthouse called Lit by Fire, which I think you can still listen to online. It's no coincidence that place names are part of many of my book titles. I am literally writing myself into the landscape. Limboland, Limboland's my first book, which won the Guyana Prize in 2000, echoed the in-betweenness of migration. From Burbies to Broadstairs, my second collection, charts the journey and begins to position me in this country, whilst my short stories, Canterbury Tales on a Cockcrow Morning and in Margate by Lunchtime, open up the conversation about settlers to Kent that move on from the Caribbean diaspora to include migration, not only from different parts of the world, but also from within the UK itself. In Margate by Lunchtime also reiterates the movement from Vikings and Romans onwards, chronicling Thanet as a place of arrival and departure for eons before Farage and his followers began to blame refugees for everything. <laughs> Writing about Thanet cemented the fact that I'd begun to see Thanet at home, as home and had witnessed not only artistic development, but physical changes in the landscape itself. The displacement that migrants feel is still a subject that's high on the agenda if you come from somewhere else. There are hundreds of writers who write about their experiences, and the term identity and belonging has become a hugely generalized one. Whether one is a refugee or a second generation writer, these themes are still being explored and articulated. Second and third generation writers are still going to the homelands of their parents in Jamaica or Barbados to seek out their roots and speak to grandmothers. The urge to find one's own voice and capture some essence of cultural belonging, especially in, a, in an atmosphere of heightened racism and an education system which has still not fully embraced the facts of colonial history and Britain's part in or in it is still ongoing. And this is because roots, to coin a much overused analogy, are still vitally important. We need to know where we come from because it's very difficult to know where you're going otherwise.